Yeah, uh, Frank, Frank let, let me, I just, because it's such a fascinating story about Fekarada and how Fekarada's murder 20 years later ends up solving the Spilato brothers' murder. So let me just give the audience a quick primer and then I'll throw it back to you and you can give some color. So for people that might not know, uh, the whole family secrets case um, that, that dropped in, in April of 2005 First, you can trace it back to to uh, our guest here's decision to reach out to the FBI. But what he just referenced was his uncle and Nick Fecarata, or sorry, his uncle Nick and Big John Fecarata, aka Big Stoop. And after the Spilato brothers are murdered in June of 1986, you saw in the movie Casino. Does it doesn't happen in a cornfield? It happens in in a basement, and then they're disposed of in a cornfield. And John Fecarata, who was uh, a, a big time mob enforcer, close to a lot of uh, big time shot callers, a guy that had been involved in numerous murders, uh, had been in charge in in some way, shape or form of burying the Spilatros. Spilatros are found within a week of the burial. Uh, the higher ups in Chicago are upset at this. Fecarata is already kind of on thin ice with the leaders or the powers that be in Chicago because of uh, some other things that were going on. I know that he was bringing his girlfriend or a wife along on scouting missions uh, out West to look at trying to kill the Spilatros before they actually were killed. I know that he won uh, a, a casino payday on one of these visits and the, the outfit said, you can't take that money because you have to, uh, you know, sign things and and whatnot, and he kind of ignored ignored them because uh, it would have placed him close to Spilatro. Uh, and then they decide to murder him. Frank's father and uncle are given the job. Frank said earlier in this interview that he was actually going to be involved with his father, but his uncle stepped in, and they tell Fecarata that they're going to. Uh, what do they tell John? What do they tell John to get him in the car? Well, we're going to extort a dentist. So they get him in the car. They're driving. Uh, Frank and and Nick are in the front seat. Uh, John Fecarata is in the back seat. John Fecarata was a big guy, and uh, Frank's uncle Nick turns around and shoots Fecarata. Fecarata has a gun himself, and like starts fighting with Nick. A Calabrese in the car. The car eventually comes to a stop. Nick Calabrese at this point has been shot by Fecarata's gun. Fecarata takes off. Nick chases him, eventually catches him in the vestibule of a bingo hall, executes him in front of a group of people, and then runs back to the car that's being driven by Frank Sr. What eventually comes back to haunt him is the fact that he dropped a bloody glove um, that's recovered at the scene by the FBI in, in the fall of 1986. And nobody knew who this glove belonged to, who the blood on the glove belonged to. And it was this big mystery for up, you know almost 20 years. And now I'm going to throw it back to Frank. Frank, because of knowledge of this family event, um, lets the FBI know that, hey, you know that Fecarata hit and that bloody glove, that's my uncle's blood and this glove. And that propelled or resulted in the FBI going to Nick where he was locked up. He he had, and, and you can talk about this, Frank, uh, your dad was trying to kill Nick in prison. Jimmy Marcello and him are telling people that Nick might go bad. So the feds go to Nick, say, not only is your brother and Jimmy Marcel trying to kill you, we're about to get a um, a, a court order to get your uh, shoulder uh, x-rayed. Wow. And I talked I talk to, or your arm, I talked to uh, the, the FBI agents that actually said this to him. And they're saying, we know what we're going to see. That x-ray is going to light up like a fucking Christmas tree. <laughs> and we're going to know... We're going to be able to tie this whole thing back to you. So that's what you were saying when you're talking about John Baccarata. But it's interesting how that thing laid dormant from 86 
uh, what, 98, 99, when, when, uh, when yeah. you provided them the intelligence that allowed them to kind of figure out what happened. And then that's the thread that kind of, you, you pull that thread and then all of Family Secrets is kind of created and the, the invincibility of the outfit when you pull that thread is, is kind of, if all falls apart. Can I follow up with something? Why would uh, your uncle and father share that information with you? Was that, was that normal for them to? That's a good question. So I'm going to jump back here to the Ficarata murder. Okay. Okay. Cause I wasn't, you know, I couldn't be in the courtroom when, when other people were testifying. So John Ficarata, we don't know. And I know my uncle didn't get on the stand. And so when the Spalacho brothers were murdered, everybody was put in vans and left. And the bodies were left there on the floor of the basement because they didn't want anybody to know where they were being buried. So we don't know if John Ficarata was the reason. Right. It doesn't make a lot of sense. If you if you look at the facts that we know, we know that Albert Taco, uh, Caesar the Fox, was the one that actually his crew was burying the Spalatros and him and his crew got separated and he ends up having to call his wife. He's all right. bloodied. Right. The wife right. ends up flipping. So really on its face, it looks like Albert Taco should have been the one that had to kind of uh, pay the piper, if you will. But for whatever reason, they blame Fekaran. Yeah. And and um, there was so much more to John. So so what had happened was when my uncle was in Vegas and another thing, too, is I have all my uncle's 302 stuff that wasn't made public. Uh, I have all the court testimony, everything, which will be on display at some point at the Mob Museum, which is a lot of cool stuff. He talks about who killed um, uh, Giancana, Richard Kane. And you're going to see through all these that John Ficarada was a badass. OK, he was very street smart. He was close with my dad and my uncle, always carried a gun. And this guy was treacherous and he was involved in a lot of big murders. He was part of that inner China town crew. OK, which, you know, Monteleone, Ficarada, my dad, my uncle, Ronnie Jarrett, uh, Jamila Picha, Angel. I mean, these guys were stone cold killers. OK, and they worked together. Anyways, John was changing just like my dad was changing. OK, uh, Johnny DeFranzo owned a car dealership. John went and got a John um, Ficarada went and got a car and he wasn't paying Johnny. Johnny was getting pissed at him. My uncle, when he was in Vegas, and I also have all the 302s of when they were trying to kill Tony in Vegas and everything that happened, too, which is some pretty interesting stuff. But anyways, um, John brought he was having an affair with his brother who died's wife and he brought her out there and introduced her to everybody with the real names he won 20 something hundred dollars gambling and he made my uncle sign for it now my dad was pissed why would you do that my uncle says frank he's my boss i'm a soldier he tells me to sign it i think he's doing the right thing He's changing. So they were mad. The final straw, and they didn't know any of that. My dad says, we're going to keep this to ourselves and put it in our back pocket in case we need it later. But John is changing. Well, John went to a guy that used to pay us $500 a week for years. And he put a gun to the guy and says, you quit paying the Keller. He says, you pay me. The guy got scared. He started paying John. When he when my dad went to see him, where's my money? He says, well, I was told to pay John now. My dad puts a knife to him. You better pay me my fucking money. This guy's like, what's going on in here? I don't want to die. I've been paying for years. My father goes, I'll handle it. He went to Angelo and he told him everything. Then Angelo went to see who he's got to see. And they says, you know what? John, we've had enough of John. He's changing. He's not the man we knew. We want him dead. Kelly, you and your brother have it. My dad came back and I'm sitting with them. This is your answer to your question, Jimmy. Okay. All right. It's 1986. You know, this is my family. Look what they did to my uncle, my dad, all this stuff. John's very street smart. I don't know how we're going to do this. I This is when I step up. I said, Dad, let, let me kill him. He goes, what? I go, listen to me. Let John think that you want him to be my mentor. And if I go with Uncle Nick, his guard will be down. My dad liked it. So we sat, we talked. He wanted to make sure I was ready. He knew I was ready. So we started practicing. My dad was the one that came up with the plan. I'm going to sit in the back seat on the passenger side, my uncle in the front seat. My uncle's going to have a box with fake dynamite in it. He's going to have a gun. When we pull back there, 
My uncle's going to radio to John Ficker, not John. My uncle's going to radio to Johnny Apes and my dad driving around in two different cars and work cars and let him know, hey, we backed into the dock. We're going to unload it. That means ready to go. While he's doing that, I'm going to reach over John's shoulder and say, John, you see, I see somebody peeking out over there. Did you see them? When he goes to look, I'm going to shoot him. My uncle's going to shoot him. We're going to exit the car and be picked up. We practiced in the basement on chairs. A week or so before it was supposed to happen, my uncle said, let me do this alone. I'll keep Frankie's gun on me as a backup. If I'm alone with John, his guard will be down. He trusts me, which was true. I got pissed at my uncle. What are you doing? And that's when he came back and told me alone. I don't want you crossing this line. My uncle, when they pulled back there, so I was out of the area then, but I had my pager. I had my rule. I had my orders on what I had to do and all that stuff, which I did follow through at the point when, when everything was said and done. But my uncle this time, instead of shooting John in the car, he was supposed to step out of the car and shoot back in. He was supposed to radio. After he radioed, he was supposed to step out of the car, shoot back in. Now, when they got there, a trick that we also did, too, was there was a gun in the glove box. My uncle opens the glove box. This is your gun if you need it. OK, well, it's a revolver sitting there. You could see it. It's positioned so you could see the bullets in it and everything. But what he didn't know was that we filed down the firing pin and tested it so it didn't work. When my when my uncle pulled out the gun in the car and didn't radio, John sees it. This is how smart he was. John starts fighting my uncle. My uncle pushes him up and, and he shoots, but it goes through his arm into John. He hits John twice. John fights with the gun, dumps out the bullets, gets out of the car and starts running for the bingo hall. My uncle's got my gun, chases him, and in the middle of the street and traffic and everything, he runs up and assassinates him in the back of the head and takes off. Now, when he's running, he's trying to wash the blood off and he's got to get rid of the gloves because it's September, right? It's a warm night. Well, when he thought he stuck them in his pocket, he dropped one of them. So that's the reason why I knew about all this. It wasn't them sitting there bragging. It was because I was involved in a lot of this stuff. Not right there involved but involved in some way, shape or form. And tell Frank, this is just my inclination. And I think this can like segue back to uh, your story and, and in this, these machinations that are uh, going in uh, through 98, 99, uh, 2000 before the uh, case actually hits. Wouldn't you say, and you, I'm guessing you might've talked to your uncle about this after the fact. Don't you feel like maybe you did your uncle a favor that, you know, this was something that he was looking for an out to. Yeah, you know, and actually my uncle dumped the gun in the catch basin and I had to go back there and get it and get it back so we can get rid of it properly. And then Jimmy Marcello had a um, a veterinarian that had to tend to my uncle's wounds. That's why the bullets were still in there. You know, so, I mean, it was it was it's like was, uh, in the Sopranos when they well, my uh, uncle, at the ED, the ED doctor doing uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, surgery. True. I mean, it's, it's true. Some of this stuff, you know, and um you know, my uncle was having a problem with my dad. He was having a problem with my dad on the street. After I had the problem with my dad, my uncle had the problem with my dad. And during that time, my dad's running out of people around him. So he pulls my youngest, I mean, my middle brother, Kurt, in to help him with book work, some collections, stuff like that. And Kurt's working for the union. Kurt is unbelievable with the union. He could have took over the local in Chicago, but he would never do that to my cousin who was running it, okay, with my uncle as the president. You know, my, my brother was very loyal to that. And my dad pulls him in this. My brother's a great guy. Everybody loves him. But my dad's pulling him in this something he doesn't belong in. You know, and, and this is how desperate my dad was getting. You know, it got so bad, my uncle did what I was doing, ignoring my dad, not going around my dad. And my dad one night tells me, we, I need to talk to Uncle Nicky. I want you to get him over to this Dunkin' Donuts parking lot. And him and Ronnie were going to be there, Ronnie Jarrett. And I went in the house and I says, look, I think my uncle, my dad wants me to set you up. They're over there. So I'm, I'm telling you, I wouldn't go. He goes, I ain't going. He goes, I don't, I guess I don't want nothing to do with him. So after that, he went to see Johnny Apes. And I didn't know this till, till later on. He went to see Johnny Apes and he told Johnny the problems he was having with his brother. Now, that bothered me because I thought he should have never did that. Because once you start airing your laundry outside the family, you become um, disposable. Oh, these guys are fighting. They killed people with us. They could put us away forever. You know what? Let's just get rid of them the first chance we have. Wow. Anyways, he tells Johnny, you know what Johnny Apes does? 
hands my uncle an old revolver and says, look, I like you. I like your brother. But if you're having problems, this is the best I can do. Do what you got to do. So basically gave him this blessing to kill my dad, which my uncle never did. But my brother is telling me, you got to kill dad. You got to kill dad. You got to kill dad. He's getting out of hand. I go, Kurt, it's not that easy. OK, it's not just, hey, you got to. Well, I can't do it. And I says, well, I'll tell you what. Let's go see Uncle Nicky. I says, I'll talk to Uncle Nicky. If he will help me, we'll take it from there. But I don't want you involved. So we go see my uncle. He goes, no, I don't want to get involved in anything. He goes, the best I can do. He hands me the gun. Johnny Apes hands in. And I'm thinking, oh, man, this is this is right. So this is how crazy it was on the on the street for a while in my family. So just for, for, for people that might not put two and two together, there's a scene in Casino where uh, – the Joe Pesci character and the Frank Collada character are doing a walk and talk. And the Frank, uh, the character was Frank Marino, but it was supposed to be Frank Collada. He says to the, the Tony Spatra character, uh, you know, Tony Gorilla says, if you're fucking the, the Jew's wife, there's going to be a problem. And I, Tony Gorilla was just with Johnny Apes. Like they, oh, they, just cha- they just changed the name. I didn't know yeah. that. Yeah. Sorry, that I I, no, I, I, that, that I digress. Is. But I always found that funny that they called Johnny Apes Tony Gorilla in uh in the in the movie uh yeah, I, did, I, did not, I did not know that. So so getting getting back to the prison, okay. So the FBI's here in there, okay. I won't wear a wire to this. They go back, they come back with all this information and they're excited. But they bring the prosecutor, Mitch Myers. Mitch Myers was a guy that we all knew on the street. This guy was one of the top prosecutors. You did not want him on your case. He was very smart and he could have made millions on the street, but he wanted to stay with the government and do the right thing. He had this thing about. He had been making mob cases uh, in the prosecutor's office. Uh, Your case, the the family secret trial that I covered was 2007. His case dropped in 05. Mitch Mars was was making cases back in the late 70s, early 80s. I mean, he had he was a. OG prosecutor who yeah, had been him and John for 30 we years. Knew, yeah, him and John Scully. We knew and John, I think John's a judge now or he's retired. But we knew those names on the street. Those are the prosecutors you didn't want on the case, you know. And our other case, we had this prosecutor that was brand new. We were like, yes, you know, <laughs> we had a brand new prosecutor, which he didn't even wind up trying us because he took a, a private job right away, right? Fresh out of the office. This so, is for another, just to give people context again. This case, Family Secrets, if, if you're unaware, this was the equivalent of the commission case in New York City. This was the biggest organized crime prosecution from a U.S. attorney's office, uh, uh, an assault on organized crime, the biggest outside of New York and the biggest ever uh, in Chicago. And the only comparison you could make uh, in the history of of the judicial system, the federal judicial system would be New York's commission case. That's how big family secrets was. Yeah. And, and it was because the commission case was the first time you used the RICO Act the way it was right. supposed to be used. Go after the organization, not individuals. And this was the first time in Chicago they, they ever did it. Yes. Yep. Um, so uh, Mitch Meyer sits down with me and he talks to me about, about 20, 20 minutes, you know, and then he leaves. Well, I find out later on. He went back and he, he came out to see what kind of condition I was in. You know, am I doing bad time? Am I, you know, am I all messed up? What's going on? So he goes back to these guys. And I found this out years later. He tells them, he said, this kid is in excellent shape. His mind is great. This isn't something he thought about overnight. This is 20 years in the making. He finally has had enough of his father trying to control his life and, and, and ruining it. Well, they never don't put him in front of a grand jury. And they never did. So when they came back in, I says, look, I've been thinking about this. My dad's such a master manipulator. I need to get him in his own words. You know what? I'll wear a wire, but please, guys, follow my lead. So I told them some ideas of what to do. And um, they went to Quantico and they made these James Bond type wires. Now, you know, uh, how do I get my dad to talk? What do I? Hey, dad, let's go out here and have a, a coffee and reminisce about all the murders you did. You know, I mean, this guy's street smart. So what I did was I went out without a wire and I seen my dad. I said, hey, I want to talk to you. I mean, this is a point where I know he wants to try to work stuff out. And we were getting some heavy shit. Um, he, I go, you know what? I thought about it. I want back in with you when I get out. But I got some issues with you. I got some real bad issues with you, dad. And you know what? We don't straighten these issues out. Not only do I not want back in, but 
I don't want nothing to do with you anymore. You're not my father if we don't straighten this up. He looked at me. He goes, okay. So I said, you, are you interested? And he goes, yeah. I go, you tell me when you want to we want to sit down. We got all the time in the world. He goes, well, well, you're not working tomorrow, are you? I go, no, let's do it tomorrow. I went back. They wired me up that morning, and I went out there. And what I did was I, 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 I used what my dad taught me in life. You know, when you want to get somebody to talk, anger, liquor. My dad didn't drink, so anger. He's mad at my uncle. Okay, know the person. I knew my dad better than anybody. The FBI had a wish list, but they let me handle it. Okay, they let me control the whole thing, which was great. We worked well together, which I didn't know if we were going to or not, but we did very well. And I pit my dad against my uncle. So he says, you know, Frankie, he goes, I've really seen a different you in here. And I think we've worked on our relationships and I'm so happy you want back in. As a matter of fact, when you get out, you're going to take over the crew at Ronnie till I get home, but you're going to earn it. He gives me the name. Of the first guy he wants me to kill is when I first see this time he wants me in. He wants me to earn it. I know he's thinking. He gives me the name of a guy named Ralph Luso who worked for us. He wants him dead. He wants me to kill him as soon as I get out. That's how I'm going to earn taking over with Ronnie. He goes, now what's your issue with me? I used my uncle. I said, Uncle Nicky said that you're a piece of shit that you killed an innocent woman in the Dauber murder. What? First of all, Frank, she wasn't innocent. I was I was in the crash car with Ronnie, the lead car, you know, and, and what about him in, in, in the half and half murder in Cicero? He killed the innocent postcard. Man, my dad went off. My dad was so pissed. He got this fixation that my uncle's not going to be able to stand up. So he's talking. We're going to all this elaborate stuff. He gets word to Jimmy Marcello and the guys in Pekin that my uncle is at that my he gives him his blessing to do what they got to do. And he doesn't think my brother's going to hold up, that he's the weak link. They try to kill my uncle. They try to kill my uncle. And one of the guys slipped a note to the war and get time off. So they locked everybody down. They shipped my uncle to Kentucky. They shipped Jimmy to, um, to Milan, Michigan. And my uncle was rooming with Harry Allman. <laughs> So can you imagine how, how close all that was? You know, and Harry Allman, for somebody that doesn't know, I mean, this guy yeah. was, you know. Harry bad. the Hook, he was yeah. the original Wild Bunch. Yeah, original Wild Bunch. I mean, Bunch. he was the captain of the Wild Bunch hit team. Exactly. Here, here's a guy that'll put a bag over his head, walk on Taylor Street, walk right up in front of everybody and shoot somebody. Everybody knows who it is, but nobody said a thing. We, we did an episode, uh, Frank, we'll send it to you. Uh, we did a big episode on him. Uh, related to, I don't know if you knew about this. There was a um, execution on a on like New Year's Day down in Phoenix in the early '80s. Oh, yeah. um, related to to Bobby, uh, uh, his cousin, uh, uh, Joe Ferriola's ne- uh, ne- uh, Alman was Ferriola's nephew, and then there was a uh, I'm, I'm blanking on like a Bobby Cruz, I think his name was. Yeah, it wasn't an Italian name. It wasn't I Italian, and and they uh, they I know that name. Yeah, they killed this couple uh, down in Phoenix. And the guy who pulled the trigger was an African-American gangster uh, who they executed in the last year. Uh, the first time uh, capital murder in Arizona in like 30 years or something. And oh, wow. we did an episode on it. We'll send it. But but Harry Alman played a role in that whole story. It's so Sorry, I digress. No, again. no, that's OK. So, you know, these meetings between my dad were hard because, you know, this is my dad. You know, this is what it's come down to. You know, you're always hoping and wishing, you know, we could be working this out, you know, and it, w- it was hard on me emotionally. And then I can't make one mistake. See, the danger level is so high that the warden didn't want to OK it. This guy's going to get killed in my prison because all the concrete in my island. When I left that office, if anybody see me going to or from the office, I'm a dead man. I don't know. I left that office. I got wires. Nobody knows because they're, they're, they're James Bond type. But. um. The FBI just sat there and waited for me or the prison alarm would go off. I'm dead on the yard. I had no backup. I'm, I'm alone. I'm totally alone. And I was OK with that. OK. You know, I had a job to do and I knew what I needed to do once I made that decision. So after a while, I didn't find out till later on. The FBI said that they seen this wearing on me a little. I didn't feel it. I didn't see it. Um, they were concerned about the safety factor. You know, how many times are we going to meet before something mistake goes? Well, it came down to this. This was their final decision. I'm ready to go out in the yard and talk to my dad. He wants he wants me to go to crew, so he wants me to know what's going on in the street. I haven't been around for a while, okay? Um, who's in charge? Who to watch out for? Who to trust? You know, and then, 
So before I'm ready to leave this office, the James Bond wires ain't working. Hmm. Like, well, we got to do this another time. I said, well, I just can't tell my, I can't hold him off too long. He's going to catch on. Can you hold him off till tomorrow morning? I go, yes. I just tell him I got a headache. I'm not feeling good. We've done that before. They go to the Detroit office. They come back with the next morning. They got a metal box like this <laughs> with wires like you got on your ears, Scott. And they tape me up with white medical tape all over my chest. And they put it in a jack strap between my legs. It's 100 degrees. <laughs> these guys, be very inconspicuous. Yeah, these guys are like, Frank, you really don't have to do this. I said, no. I said, this is the only opportunity we were getting. And I could see the look in their eyes. This kid ain't coming back alive today. OK, but, you know, he's insistent on doing it. I get out there. My dad gets done telling me, I mean, unbelievable. Right. Spilatros, who was here, who was doing this, who was doing that in detail, which collaborated with my uncle testifying and that on tape. Anyways, he steps into me and grabs my shirt. And I'm like, oh, shit, it still goes through my body. Now, I thought about punching my dad and running for the door. I got to go past the bocce court. OK, nobody's on my side. I'm dead. So I step back. I grab my shirt. I go, dude, what are you, what are you doing? I said, I want to see that tattoo you just got. You know they're illegal in here. I go, yeah. And I'm holding my shirt. I go, look, the guard over there. Go look at him. I says, if he sees it, he'll put me in a hole. I ain't going to be able to get you the vegetables and all the other stuff anymore. Oh, yeah, good one. Yeah, show me tomorrow. I walked away. I was like this. The FBI said, that's it. I was able to get transferred to another prison for the drug program because there was a waiting list. that got a lot of guys did it. I wound up down in Coleman, Florida, where I finished my time. And I went. And I got back out on the street. You know, people, when I say I didn't, I did all my time. So the one thing I asked the FBI, there were two things I asked the FBI and they did it. I said, I have a lot of legitimate friends and my family members that I don't want to put them in the middle of this. I said, please don't pull them in the middle. And, and number two, I don't want to lose any time. I'm in line for this drug program. If you got to pull me, if you got to do anything, I don't want to lose any time because of this. So, you know. They made sure I didn't lose time. I, um, so I was a couple months short of my actual time that I had to do, but that, that would have been lost time. So I did get out, I think, two months earlier. I did 33 months out of, uh, out of uh, uh, 52 or 56, I think. So with the good time, the drug program and everything like that, it, it all worked out. But it was a little short of actual, you know, with the program. So, so let's, let's fast forward to the trial. Summer, yes. of, summer of 07, a young Scott Bernstein is in the uh, media section uh, every day, taking notes, preparing for uh, my my first major book release. Um, me and Frank are two of the only three people that put a book out about the family secrets, uh, sh uh, shameless self-promotion, go get Frank's book, go get my book. Um, and then we'll give Frank, a t uh, you know, when we're done with the interview, a chance to, to shout out all the places you could find him. But uh, it was something, you know, you lived a, your life and, and your family's life is like out of a movie. But for me, as a 28 year old, covering his first trial you want to talk about being thrown in the deep end and i loved it i loved being in the deep end but covering that trial was like what everything i envisioned of covering a major mafia trial it it, it fit that bill you know the the cameras were everywhere the 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 tension you could cut it with a knife the the characters or the 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 actual, you know, stars of the show, your father, Jimmy Marcello, uh, Joey Lombardo, were living in uh, Frank Schweiss, but we're living up to uh, the billing. I, I remember the first uh, hearing I uh, covered in the trial was for, uh, was when they um, caught Frank uh, the German in December of, of 05, and I covered his arraignment. And uh, that was literally my first time in a course. It was a you know two years before the trial, but I was starting to cover some of the um, hearings. And and Frank Schweiss, again, lived up to the billing. They roll him in in a wheelchair, and he starts throwing threats out at people in the middle of the court. This eighty year old killer with an oxygen mask, um, growling and barking. Uh, so I just wanted to set the scene. I didn't know Frank at this time, uh, but. I saw him on the stand. His uncle took the stand. His uncle was the first made member of the Chicago Mafia to ever testify. And his father took the stand. So I'm and interested. Joey Lombardo. Well, and Joey Lombardo took the stand. But 
just talk about your testimony. Obviously, you couldn't watch your father or your uncle because you had, uh, you know, you couldn't be in the courtroom. Appeals, motions, all that. You can only but, go and testify, then you got to leave. But just, you know, talk about being, this was the last, the home stretch of your cooperation. You got to get on the stand. Your uncle needs to get on the stand. And you need to really, you know, you're at the goal line. Now you got to punch it in and make sure that the convictions stick that he's found guilty and then you really get to you know hit hit the jugular yeah you know i did like my father did i used everything he taught me this was not a game this was not a show okay it was very emotional to me see i only went against my dad i really opened the doors for all this but when they tried to go against my uncle first made member ever to testify okay in chicago OK, like that, because there weren't a lot of guys who made members that would testify. My uncle was involved in so much stuff and he had so much knowledge. So in this, if you go all the way back to the early 1900s, there's like 14 solved murders of over 1,200 murders. OK, in this case alone, 18 solved and close to 40. This is per FBI, close to 40 um, murder solved. Giancana, Richard Kane. I mean, a lot of them that nobody knew who the players were. They had a list. I, I, I seen that list from a distance one time and I looked as best as I could and I wasn't supposed to when we were doing stuff. And they had who was there, who did what, through all the different cooperating witnesses. In fact, I have Jerry Scarpelli's um, uh, 302s too, you know, which are very interesting. So that's all going to be- that's a, whole, that's a whole other episode. Jimmy that's and I, we're going to, for people that know, Jerry Scarpelli was a uh, Wild Bunch member who- flipped and then he was a strong bad ass guy yeah. and he flipped and then he ended up suspiciously dead in mcc oh, he killed himself he killed himself killed himself yeah. uh was, before was, before uh before he could ever testify but that that's, was that's the kind of balls he had okay yeah. he really testified because he wanted to get his girl off the hook this is what was told to me through my father and my uncle which was handed down from them through the hierarchy and as soon as he did, and as soon as she was released, he knew that if he killed himself, they had this information, but they could never use it. And that's why he did it. But you, are uh, you, go ahead. Yeah, I, I, sorry to digress, but are you comfortable? I know you have a, something in the works releasing that information. Are you comfortable now uh, discussing what what you saw happen at Giancana? That's always been kind of murky, what the the situation behind his well, mother. It, it was his uncle that told them what he Yeah, when the 302. Did. But my I, I, dad had told me one time, but it was my uncle's 302s where okay. I learned exactly what it was, okay? And then I had a conversation with my brother, Kurt, too, because my uncle had told my brother, Kurt. But it was my uncle's 302s. So I got a lot. I'm in possession of a lot of stuff from my father's belongings because rightfully it went to me. But I think the government might have accidentally, I don't know if they did or not, left a lot of stuff in there that I shouldn't have got. So I learned a lot from all that. Um, I did not know other than what my father had told me prior to that. Okay. And it's a whole story. So I mean, you want me to go into it real quick or do you want to, I, I, I would, I would like, yeah, that. doesn't it, doesn't it implicate Tony <laughs> and like it, it implicates Tony Accardo, I think it, it does. So, it, and, 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 and look, I wasn't there. My dad wasn't there. My uncle wasn't there. Okay. So, you know, I'm just telling you what I was told, and it made sense. And that's what I tell people, okay? First of all, look at Tony Accardo. Here's a man that never did a night in jail. Here's a very man that knew how to kill. Here's a man that's trying to go legit with everything. I mean, this is one of the most powerful mob bosses where he was trying to take over the years, right? I'd say I'd say he's the most powerful mafia boss in American history. That's my personal okay. opinion. Very you, could, you could argue you could argue some guys from New York, but I don't think anybody in terms of longevity and pound for pound, top pound for pound, top to bottom shot calling. I don't think anybody uh, reaches a Cardo. Master manipulator, right? <laughs> he got Bill Romer to love him, but yet Tony Spalaccio, Bill Romer hated him and made it personal. Okay, that Tony Accardo didn't trust Romer. He didn't trust the FBI. It was all just like they were doing. It was a game of chess back and forth, okay, trying to work things out. Tony was very smart. Now, when Sam, when they felt Sam had a goal for a lot of reasons, okay, everybody says it was his his, his um, bodyguard, trusted best friend, Butch Blassie. 
Yeah. Or it was Tony Spilatro. Spilatro. Yeah. What I look at is this, and this is what I was told. When I'm telling you this, I'm telling you this through my dad and my uncle and sitting with them, which which I learned, which makes sense. You're going to – Sam Giancana was a very treacherous man, and he was a very smart man. He knew he fell out of favor. Okay? So in this life, if you get whistled for and you don't come, you're dead, right? Do you think Tony's going to whistle for him? Sam ain't dead dumb, Right. Okay, so what did Tony do? He sets up something where he's going to come to his house alone, right? F- FBI, local police sitting outside. You think he's going to let Tony Spilatro in? Butch Blassie was close with him. And this is what I don't know, okay, what Butch Blassie's part. He said he never wanted to talk about it on any 302s or anything. I'll never talk about that murder. And, you know, you, Butch Blassie is not happy with the new mob now. OK, and the way they're treating Sam and him. So are you, Tony Accardo, going to trust Butch Blassie? You can't trust anybody because you're 60. What was he? 63, I think. 63 or 66. My, 63, my age. Because if something falls through, you're going to jail for the rest of your life. Right. OK, who knows more on Tony than Sam? So you set up a meeting where you want to come to the house and, and, and you want to talk about, you know, the trial coming up in a couple of weeks. So how we got in, I don't know. OK, all right. Never talked about that. All I know was that it was a, 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 a 22 with a silencer and that it was Tony Cardo and that Tony dropped the gun in a bad place. He didn't mean for it to be found. OK, 22 doesn't have a big kick on it. All right. Now, how in the 302, it was Angelo telling my dad and my uncle, the old man, never too old for heavy work, heavy work. Mm-hmm. Killing somebody. Now, if you yes. think- well, let me ask one more thing, or let me just uh, in- interject this. That to me could be a indicator of a Cardo's presence. So we know that Giancana was shot in the back of the head while he was preparing a meal of sausage, sausage and peppers. peppers. So he tr- now he turned his back right. on somebody he trusts, trusted, right? And he was cooking. I feel like in other situations, somebody would be cooking for Sam. Since Tony Accardo was over Sam, Sam was cooking for Tony. I don't know. That's just my, again, my uh, my quick uh, I mean, um, insight into um, the potential that that, 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 that little fact could, could lend merit to them. Going on the, the, you know, they said, well, the police, the police left for a few minutes. Well, let me tell you something. You know, the oldest trick in the book is you take somebody and you go and you and you call and say you see a robbery going on or you see an officer got shot, you know. And what do they do? They leave the scene of surveillance and then they come back a few minutes later. You only need that few minutes. I'm not saying that was done. I'm yeah. just telling you, trying to think through what I learned and who I am. I don't know. My guess, and this is a guess that maybe it was Butch Blassie that let him in. Butch Blassie didn't want to know. Maybe Butch Blassie let him in and left. OK, but I feel that the only person that Sam would have been comfortable with and would have met for a reason would have been Tony. Now, everybody argues to this day about it. To me, that's pure Tony Cardo. That's his smarts. If you if you right now, if somebody says I was there and I seen Tony do it, people would still doubt it. If the yeah. person was really there, that's what Tony wanted. Put doubt in people's mind. Very, very smart man. So, Frank. I'll just say I'll just say about your uncle. Your uncle gave an, an amazing. Uh, I think it was two three days of testimony. Um, you gave again a, a, a great uh, couple days of testimony. So talk a little. I mean, you didn't see your uncles, but talk about yours. And then as we finish up, I'll give my. I don't think your dad did himself any favors from jump as great as you and your uncle were were as bad as your dad was. Yeah, so the I knew my dad better than anybody. So the FBI and Mitch Myers, I got to spend a lot of time with them. Mike May spent a lot of time. Uh, the lead guys on the case, I spent a lot of time. I spent hours and hours and days and days going through it. But they told me, they said, we've never had any cooperating witness work so hard and put so much input in it. I says, well, because if my dad walks out, the only option I got is to wait for him as he's walking out with a shotgun. You're not supposed to say that to us. I says, it's the truth, you know? So, you know, 
when I walked in that courtroom and I looked at my dad, I hadn't seen him in six years. He had aged. I was overcome with emotion. So overcome, they told me to walk up to the, to the stand. And I don't know if you noticed or remember, I stepped up on the stoop and got right in the judge's face. Mm-hmm. They were, the, the FBI lawyer, like, well, what are you doing? I says, uh, you told me to go up there. It, you know, I was just, so they, they were smart. They put me on for an hour that day. And then we had a three day break to practice just to get all that stuff out. Because emotionally, I want to run over and hug my dad. That's my dad. I still love him. I hate his ways. What am I doing in public court? You know, so that was hard. It was hard. In fact, another thing I did, and I know you might remember I got uh, Judge Zagel. You know, I kept <laughs> I kept getting too close to the microphone. Yeah. You know? yeah he's like, can you, can you just step back? Now, another thing I did to calm my nerves was I asked to be able to go sit in the courtroom in the chair the night before. Okay, the day before. So the, we had to have the marshals there, you know, and all that. But um, so I was able to sit in the courtroom and get a feel for everything and where everybody's going to be and what table my dad was going to be at. And that was just me preparing for all, all of this. Um, you know, after a week of testifying, I think it was four days. One day was only an hour or two. Um, I was uh, sleepless nights, overcome with emotion. Uh, um, the you I, came off very authentic, go, and you could tell by looking at the jury, watching the jury, because I was watching the jury the entire trial. You could see that they connected with you. They felt I don't know, empathy, sympathy. You were able to communicate that and immediately build that rapport with a jury, and that's not something that always happens. Well, if you and remember, both you and your uncle were able to do that. Well, when we started, I didn't know. So the FBI puts people in the audience. I should say the prosecutors put lawyers in the audience to see how it's going. So they get feedback, you know, critique. Well, the first day we were going over the recordings, they came back at lunchtime and they go, it's a mess. We don't understand anything. So I says, look, I got an idea. I says, play the thing like we did. And what I would do is all the stuff I wanted to answer. I, I count on my fingers. So if I had eight things and then. I go through the whole thing and say what I this is what this meant. This was that meant. And then John Scully would question me after that. And they said that went perfect, which was was good because you need everybody to understand what's going on so they can follow. And Judge Zagel, all he was waiting for was me. He you don't know if you've seen him, but he was reading it and he's watching. If I said one thing out of line that he thought was bullshit, he would have jumped all over me and I would have lost my credibility. And he didn't. And not that I'm patting myself on the back. It was preparation and what I knew. But I did so well with, you know, what I was doing and my preparation that Mitch Myers comes up to me and says, we're going to put you on the stand and we're going to play a tape with Anthony Twan Doyle, my dad and Mike Rickey. And you're going to tell us what they talk about. But he didn't tell me as soon as they do that, the defense attorneys are going to jump up because you can't play something in federal court if somebody was. So what I did was they played it. And I said, in my conversations with my dad or anybody around me, purse meant bloody glove. This meant that. This meant that. And they did a um, what was that when they all come up? They, they made me leave the room. They we need a, ben, a, a bench conference. A bench conference, right? I'm in the, I'm in, I'm scared of height, right? That's on the 20 something floor. The room they got me in is a little room and it's all windows. And I'm walking around trying not to get to the window. I'm more scared of the height than I am of going back into the trial. Mitch comes mm-hmm. in, he says, okay, you're going to go back in there and finish this. I go, what? It's so calmly. I go, what? They allowed it? The judge allowed it? He goes, yeah. And, you know, and Joey Lombardo was getting mad because they're like, hey, what kind of attorneys we got here? You guys can't win one motion. You guys can't win one objection. What's going on there? Well, you know, this case was put together. Well, after a week, if I'm the stand, I get up, I look at my dad, I walk away, I go in a room and tears are flooding down my face. Prosecutor come in there like, what's wrong? Something happened. I go, no, you know how sick and sad this is. I just seen my dad for the last time in life. And it was the last time in life. Now, during the trial, the prosecutor says, hey, how do we get your dad mad. You know how to get him out of character when he gets mad. I told Marcus Funk. I said, he don't know. He was the, he was the, uh, he was the BG of that crew. You had the OG prosecutors, Scully and Mars. And he had Marcus Funk, who was this younger guy. And Scully and Mars were, were kind of uh, tiny. Yeah. Marcus Funk looked like he was a tight end for the bears. Yeah. I said, 
you got to do it. I says, you walk up to him, point in his face, raise your voice like you're threatening him and call him some kind of name. And he did. And he got my dad so mad that they he you threatened know, him. He threatened him. Marcus Funk, Marcus Funk had the rare honor to say that through the family secrets conspiracy trial, he was threatened by two, not one. He was threatened by Frank the German and Frank Cal- uh, Frankie Breeze, Frank Calabrese. So he obviously got under the skin of those guys. They didn't know. Uh, He's the new guy. Yeah. Like, what, what, what did he say specifically? What did your father say? To, to well, I, I mean, what it was told, I wasn't there, was that he mouthed the words, you're a dead man. Yeah, wow. he, he, he was like, smile. And then I want you to comment on this as, as we're wrapping up. You know, my big takeaway from watching your father's testimony. Joey Lombardo got up there and and thought that his little quirky, quippy grandpa act could play on the stand for multiple days because it had worked uh, to ingratiate him with the the courtroom and the jury over the months leading up to his testimony. He was very funny and- They were all laughing. They were all all laughing. He was the only guy that sat there, with just sat there. Yeah. Yeah. Joey Lombardo. Marcel, yeah, Marcelo didn't didn't break a smile or I mean Marcelo, like you said, he had a poker face on. Lombardo was, you know, playing his clown act and decided that he thought he could keep it going on the stand. And then very quickly, the little, you know, five second quips it couldn't sustain multiple hours on the stand. And he just looked like an a, a, a old man that was lying. Your dad, on the other hand, not only was he bad on the stand, but your father would say, and I was, your father was closer. I was closest to your father out of all of, um, on the defense table where I sat in the media, um, section, I I could literally almost reach out and touch your father. And, um, he, he was doing himself a, a great disservice. And I, I questioned, why Joe Lopez, who was who was his attorney, wasn't stepping in. But every time someone got up on the stand and started to just describe your father taking part in a murder, he would be grinning ear to ear, purpose, um, almost like he was relishing the uh, you know getting to relive it. And it wasn't like one time; it was like a dozen times. And oh. I'm thinking. I'm 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 whispering to the other reporters. What is Lopez doing? Why isn't Lopez whispering in his ear? Stop smiling. Joe had no control over my dad. One thing my dad, see, I knew my dad better than anything. The biggest mistake my dad and Joey Lombardo had is they were very good at sit downs, okay, which I'm sure you guys explained yeah. sit-downs before. And at sit downs, you can control the room, you can control the table, and you can lie. When you get into a federal court like that, you can't take the stand when you know that you're guilty of 99% of the stuff they're doing. So my dad would smile because he wanted every, he was laughing like this is all bullshit. This right. Is no, all- I know what his I know that was what yeah. like that's how he would have explained it, but the way that it was coming off to the jury and to the gallery in the courtroom was that he was taking pleasure and them talking about him as a sociopathic murderer. The government was shocked in total shock when Joe Lombardo was going to take the stand. And they felt he did so terrible that there's no way my dad would take the stand. Yeah. So when my dad decided to take the stand, they were going to have a field day. All they wanted to do was get him mad, get him mad. And who got him mad? The judge. You can't do that. What do you mean I can't do that? I'm defending myself. So you catch little pieces, right? He starts shaking because he's getting mad. He tried to control himself because of his temper. And I, again, I wasn't in the courtroom, but I would get the feedback. Okay. And that that's that that's what I got. So yeah. and the other thing that he did, too, was once he found out. So he was telling Jimmy Marcello before the tapes came out. He goes, this is all done by my son. Not my brother. It's my son. My brother would never have the brains to do this. My son's doing it. And my brother told my son everything. I never told him nothing. When the tapes came out, Jimmy was steaming because my dad's the one telling me everything. And I knew that the only way to get my dad was get him in his own words because he would have manipulated him. You know, they didn't they didn't everybody get charged on what my uncle testified to. Everybody got charged on the stuff. 100% that my uncle testified to from the tapes of my dad. 
So it was my dad's voice, my dad's own words that incriminated him. And that's what I tried to do. So yeah, when- Marcel, Marcelo and Lombardo had almost no physical evidence uh, tying them to anything. Joey Lombardo had a fingerprint on a car rental paper. Um, but other than that, Jimmy Marcello was convicted based on his voice on an answering machine. Uh, but oh, yeah, to your point, it, it was your your dad's talking on those tapes that my made everyone realize that uncle, and Marcello were guilty. There's still people out there that think, oh, this is all a lie. OK, my uncle alone, I don't think Jimmy would have been, you know, I don't think he would have been found guilty. There wasn't enough. OK. And so unfortunately for Jimmy, it was my dad was the one, you know, and my dad hired Lopez because he was close with Jimmy and 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 um, and uh, Mickey Marcello. So he wanted them to know everything he was doing so that he wouldn't get killed in prison. Okay. I have a love. I have a love hate relationship with the shark, Joe Lopez, <laughs> where uh, sometimes he'll he'll say uh, complimentary things on posts about stuff I write. And then sometimes he'll be like, oh, that's Bernstein fantasy land again. <laughs> yeah. and I'm just like, really, Joe? Joe, uh, Joe's a character. Joe's a character. Joe, I so get as, a, go ahead. Sorry, Frank. I get along with him good. Uh, Bobby Rasha, a uh, dear friend of mine that's a lawyer. Uh, he represented the uh, uh, Flores brothers against Al yeah. Chapo. Yeah. Yep. Anyways, um, they so, were very, very close, him and Lopez. And, you know, and so, you know, when Lopez was, I can't believe the kids did this. Well, when Lopez thought my dad had no money. And when it came out that my dad had all this money and everything, Lopez was pissed. And then my dad started giving it to Lopez and Lopez started changing his, you know, well, maybe this guy, you know, maybe they got something here, you know. So, so everybody was convicted. Uh, let's just give a quick RIP. Uh, we were talking about family secrets. Again, something that meant a lot to me, obviously meant more to, <laughs> meant more to Frank. But uh, RIP to Judge Zagel, uh, a, a true uh, superstar of the federal bench. Uh, uh, you know, salt of the earth. Uh, just I thought was a was a a great judge, and and he passed away recently. And then shortly after um the trial, we found out that Mitch Mars uh, was battling cancer, and that was his really his last hurrah. Uh, w- was getting the family secrets conviction. So R.I.P. to Mitch Mars. Your father passed away. Um, was about five years after two thousand twelve. So on Christmas a day, hey, uh, your, your, uncle, year. your uncle uh, passed away yeah. recently in the last year. Um, and the only guy, the only major guy that's that's still locked up doing time for this is Jimmy Marcello. Yeah. Uh, Joey Lombardo Nine. passed away a couple of years ago and actually had threatened Judge Zagel um, from from prison. I think he was making the argument that he was joking uh, around with a with a gangbanger, but the gangbanger went and told um, the prosecutors that Joey was looking to kill Zagel. Um, so again, that, just given uh, you know the the uh, the post post game uh, uh, notes. Um, and then, was, was your father in danger when he was the last few years of his life? What, what, was the outfit going to take it out on him for your decision? Um, I, I never heard of anything. Okay. Oh. He was for he was locked down in a special lockdown SAMS because he put out a hit on me and my uncle that was uh, that was confirmed by the FBI through credible witnesses for one hundred fifty thousand and the threat. So he got put down. He was locked down twenty four seven. And Mar- Marcel, they had a uh, U.S. marshal on the pad. I mean, they came really close to locating. I don't know about you, Frank. I know they came really close to locating your uncle. And and well, that's, maybe that's killing that's him before trial. The thing was the first time in the witness protection um, yeah. history that they that they compromised. It was, um, yeah, it was another police officer that was trying to get close to a decorated marshal, yeah. and um, because of the the tapes in the visiting room, they were they were able to show that this marshal was passing information of who my uncle was going to uh, testify, what he was going to testify, and allegedly the route they were going to take to bring him from the safe house to. Because they flew him in on a private plane and they put him in a safe house. And uh, and this guy wound up getting a 10 year sentence. Yeah. And they so, gave him opportunities to, you know, cooperate and do the right thing. And he was stubborn. He he was saying that he would have never followed through with anything. He was just trying to get on their good side so they can help him find other fugitives. Okay. Which, uh, <laughs> so this was awesome. Uh, I, I this is what if not my 
favorite episode we've done. It's in my top two or three. I can't thank you enough. I, I was, again, the longest episode we probably ever did, but I think that uh, Frank was deserving of it. He told a story that just, uh, it, it just floors you and, and draws you in and captures you. Uh, he's a dynamic speaker. Thank you so much, Frank, for telling your story, man. You're, you're, you're welcome. Thank you. Thank you guys for having me, you and Jimmy. Um, you know, and please and, let everyone know where they can find, where they can consume your content. So I was doing tours in Chicago and private appearances. I've been working for two years to try to do something with the Ma Museum. It's an unbelievable museum. The people that are running it, unbelievable. And I felt that I can add a lot to it. Um, so um, I'm going to be starting there in January full time. And uh, we have a lot of cool stuff that we're going to work with. I'm donating a lot of stuff to the museum. Um, a lot of stuff that people don't normally see, like 302s. People are like, what a 302? A 302 is what the FBI writes after they have a meeting with a confidential informant, CI. And uh, court testimony, I have stuff that's never made, made public before. You got to... There's so much that hasn't made, been made public. And then it's going to... We're going to do a little, like a little... Uh, small private groups, sit downs, different topics, you know, uh, talk about what it was like to be in a life. How did we dress? How, how, how did we, you know, how do we survive on the street? What did we think about the FBI? Um, uh, planning and assisting in a murder and, and how it's done. You know, it's not like in the movies where somebody just, hey, we're going to kill this guy and they jump in the car and go try to kill him. I mean, there's months and months. And, and yeah. I'm going to talk about murders that happened, that how there was surveillance on him and everything. The guys sitting in vans, being in jugs, looking through binoculars in a box in the van because he put tinted windows, everybody knows, right? So you got an empty box sitting there with somebody in it taking shifts. So tell them about your book. I mean, Frank initially uh had gary ross who was the uh, sea biscuit um director and writer uh that was going to develop it it's now in uh another group's hands but i have no doubt that sooner rather than later you're going to see uh frank's book uh turned into either a feature film or um a limited series or or regular oh, series so on a streaming on a streaming uh, service. This is it. It's the New York Times bestseller, and I tell everybody it's a family story. Organized crime was our family business, but this is more of a family story. I use the phrase: when you bring the street in the home, it corrodes the family structure, and that's what I talk about. That's what I've learned. It, it, it ripped our family apart. And, you know, we're still, a lot of my family members are still dealing with the effects of it. As far as Hollywood, I've been working on this for a long time. I have great people now. I have John Hillcoat as the director. He's doing that latest series that's out with um, Taylor Sheridan, okay, with the undercover ops. He loves this story. I have uh, Taylor Matern, who wrote... Um, the latest one he wrote, he's a young guy, he wrote The Hustle with Adam Sandler. Okay, he put together a script that's unbelievable, and he put together a pilot that's unbelievable. I'm working with a guy named Brian Haas that used to run Mike DeLuca Studios. Okay, Mike DeLuca bought uh, Fifty Shades of Grey, made hundreds of millions, but he's still a force in Hollywood. I'm with Studio 8, uh, a, a Studio 8. Um, uh, Which is a subsidiary. I, I know it. Uh, I worked for them for, for a couple of years. They're a subsidiary of Sony. Uh, they're the ones that I did the white boy, Rick um, yeah. film with. So I, I'm familiar with the studio, uh, studio eight people. I'm very grateful to them. They gave me my well, first, did. first on, entry did. point into Hollywood, which I thought was an excellent movie. It's an excellent story. When you were doing that, that's when I was still, when I started negotiating with them. Yeah. yeah. I, I didn't love, honestly, I didn't love the film. Uh, I'm a much uh, prouder of the documentary, which is on Netflix, which, uh, but that's neither here nor there. I'm sure that the people that are behind your project are going to do great by Ben well, Affleck. At one point, off, who was who owns ben, it? He used to run Warner Brothers, right? And Ben Affleck at one point was on board to play your dad. I would have loved, yes, yes. To have seen well, that. When COVID hit, so you know things happen when COVID yeah. hit. We're talking to a lot of actors. We're with CAA. I'm finally, I had my rights stolen. I was sleeping on couches, trying to get doors slammed in my face. You know, um, it seemed like every time I went somewhere and if something was ready to happen, I go to CBS, ready to happen, the girl gets another job with another Yeah, company. I know. It's a, it's a slow, yeah. slow well, I can tell you, it's, it's the backstories on being in Hollywood yeah. is 
and they, 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 I'm going to end with this. So in real life, you have to work and worry about the double cross. In the mob, you have to worry about the triple cross. In Hollywood, you got to worry about the quadruple and quintuple cross. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, and, and I've been fortunate enough, though, real quick, Scott, because the people I'm working with, uh, uh, they love working with me. And I felt and they've told me I contributed a lot. So I'm really enjoying it. And I want it to be something that's good, not something that's cheesy. You know, I want everybody talking like this and you know, <laughs> I want it to be a good story because you don't a- want a bunch of old soprano retreads. Uh, the thing we all agreed on Sopranos right. was already made. Goodfellas was already made. OK, Casino was already made. We don't want to remake those. We right. want something. And so that's why it comes with the family. So it's really Everything is evolved around me and my father and our relationship. And it's did, it's going to really be good. Did you like Casino, by the way, Frank? Do you like that yeah, film? It's, it's, it's Hollywood. Look, I, what I learned by working in Hollywood, and Scott, you could probably back me up on this, is, Jim, they, they take three or four characters and mold them into one. So mm-hmm. documentary is where you can tell what really happened, correct? Did, did you, you know? go see – did you go see – we're going off another rabbit hole here. <laughs> but did you go okay. see Casino when it came out in 95 with your yeah. dad and uncle? No, I went with some friends and I'm sitting there and I'm like saying to myself, I can't say it out loud. That's wrong. That didn't happen. Like that. <laughs> you know, and I'm laughing. I'm like, oh, God, you know, um, but yeah, I did. But I, again, I knew it was Hollywood. And, you know, Martin Scorsese has a way of taking stuff and, 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 you know, putting a twist on it. That's very entertaining. But then you got to look at a documentary, you know, yeah. and. I don't think there was a documentary made by Rose. Uh, uh, well, we did, again, sh- shameless self promotion. Uh, if you go to f- uh, Fox Nation, which is the Fox News Channel streaming service, I uh, uh, co produced and starred in a the true story behind Casino. It's called Skim City. Uh, we released it uh, about five months ago. Oh, I got, it's I got an it. hour and a, hour and a half on the true story behind Casino. We also did one on. We also did one on uh, Goodfellas. Uh, so go check those out on the Fox yeah, Station definitely. streaming service. Definitely. Frank, this was awesome, man. We're going to have you back on. I promise. Um, maybe we'll do some remote content. Uh, yeah, I'd like to do Vegas. just an outfit one time. Like it was yeah. Frank, just an outfit, like, you know, just other things in the outfit that he can speak to. I think would yes. be fun. Yeah, definitely. Thank definitely. you so much. Uh, I'm you sorry. Guys. I went a little long, but, uh, I think it's worth it. I think, uh, there's a lot of meat on the bone. I don't think there's a lot of fat. A little, so we got going. <laughs> yeah. So thank you, Frank, uh, Jimmy, uh, for Jimmy and for Benny behind the glass. Uh, OG Pod out. We'll see you next week.